Hello, so today it's all about the Canon G7X Mark II. Listen to that, eight frames a second. So I've had this camera for the last couple of years. It's kind of been my sidearm of choice. I bought it very specifically for a, a, an assignment. One of my last big foreign assignments before COVID was to go to Uganda and I bought this camera to kind of be my be my sidekick really to be in this pouch on my belt all of the time just in case you know i got in a situation where i needed to take pictures and i don't have my main cameras with me but also to shoot some behind the scenes video footage to kind of leave on a tripod in various different places just to get some behind the scenes footage of the ongoing assignment and just because i can i'm just going to show you 30 seconds of that footage right now and then i'll be back to talk more about the good and the bad parts about this camera So this is a 20 megapixel one inch sensor camera with a 24 to 100 millimeter zoom lens and it has a maximum aperture of f1.8 to 2.8 at the long end and all of those things to me are quite sweet spots. You know 20 megapixels cool, 24 to 100 is perfect focal length for a camera like this and the fact it's got a nice wide aperture means you can throw your background out of focus and achieve some really good quality pictures. And uh, it shoots eight frames a second, which is cool. And the ISO range is great, goes up to 12,800. So you can shoot in low light nice and easily. Um, there's lots and lots of good things about this camera. Now Canon have always had a habit of producing cameras that don't necessarily grab the headlines. They're not, you know, the coolest, most aesthetic, best looking things on the block. And yet they just kind of do what you need and they do what you need really well. And that is a, this camera is a classic example of that. So I know most of my viewers are more about stills photography, but I'll touch on video because it, it's kind of of importance with a camera like this. You know, a lot of vloggers were interested in this camera and it doesn't have 4K and it doesn't have a mic input and those two things are, are kind of deal breakers for some people but actually it has 1080 uh, 50 frames per second so you can slow the footage down by 50% and it has a reasonable microphone on the top especially if you put a, a little wind baffler on the top and some of those limitations for me are fine you know I don't I don't want to use this camera for pro level video production um, you know, so I, I'm not interested in 4K actually, and I wonder if a lot of people kind of get caught up in some of those specs unnecessarily. But it's, it, for some, it will be a negative. Um, it has a great folding screen, which um, enables you to, it doesn't have an eyepiece, but you have the screen, which is a touch screen, and it enables you to use it in a kind of, uh, top-down method like that, which I think is a really lovely discreet way of shooting, especially if you turn the, sh the beep off and the uh, shutter speed, you can change the, the volume, or in fact, I think you can even change the sound. It, all of the user interfaces, the buttons, the menus are just great, I think. If you're kind of coming from any kind of um, what I class as normal photography cameras with you know apertures and shutter speeds and all the normal settings and you'll take to this like a duck like water I did that's for sure um, you know it has this great zoom ring zoom rocker switch on the top and then this dial here you can set to I have it set as my aperture ring so I like shooting aperture priority and that does a great job of allowing me to control my aperture and then I have an exposure compensation dial on the thumb near, near my thumb which is exactly where it should be and I won't go into the menu systems too much apart from to say that it works really well you know I, I think I'd go so far as to say it's probably the most intelligently designed user interface that I've come across uh, you know, of all the cameras that I've used, I've not had a problem finding any of the settings, which isn't always the case. Some of these, some of these cameras, especially the modern cameras, are really difficult. You have to sort of spend your life deep diving into the menu to figure out how to do stuff, but this isn't quite like that. So I'll just talk about the use. So like I said, I have it in this pouch. 
and this sits on my belt nearly all of the time when I'm away on assignment. The camera goes in the back, I have this little plastic tripod which goes in the front and I have a spare battery in there. The battery life's good, a lot of people have moaned about the battery but I've, I've got only one spare battery and I've never run out of power and then I have a bunch of these little um, Ryko wind baffle things which um, I don't quite know where they are, which go on top of the camera to stop the, um, the wind noise as and how you wish. Um, and that just sits there all the time and you can grab it and pull it out and it just kind of works. These are great pouches from Think Tank by the way, it's kind of big enough to get everything you need for the day in but small enough to, um, you know, to be quite discreet and not get in the way. Okay, so negatives. The first negative is it doesn't have 4K if you're into, um, if you're into video. It doesn't have a mic input, you've got to work around that, okay? Um, the second negative for me is that the, um, the, is dust. I've, there's been a few dust spots that have got inside this camera and there's no way of removing them as far as I can make out. If someone can tell me different, then that'd be cool. Now, also, it had this, <laughs> the obvious elephant in the room is that it has this kind of weird lens cap thing that folds in and out uh, like a shutter, uh, these bits of metal and springs. And as, as soon as I saw it, I thought that's going to be a problem for me. <laughs> it's just a matter of time until that breaks. And it did break. I dropped it on a rock and it broke. And rather than doing the sensible thing of sending it away to get it fixed, I just ripped it off with a pair of pliers. And it kind of, <laughs> it kind of works fine now. But I'm not sure if that now lets even more dust in because I think, you know, this cap came off of the front of the lens as well, which I think was quite good for keeping a bit of dust out. So you know, that's not cool, that broke, I'm probably clumsy, I treat these things badly, not everybody else will, um, but I've kind of repaired it because I found a Yashica lens cap from an old rangefinder camera that fits snugly on the front, <laughs> it's kind of perfect. Um, apart from that, I don't really have any other negative points to make. Like I said, I think that some of the other camera manufacturers have made things which are sexier and have higher specs, but for me, this camera has been a great companion. And the image quality, when I, the part of the decision making process of getting this was that I needed to know that it was capable of producing professional level pictures, you know, raw, it captures in raw onto a single SD card. And uh, I needed to know that the pictures were high enough quality for me to give to clients. There's no point in me having a camera that, um, you know, takes great pictures, but then the quality isn't good enough. This is good enough. I would say that the image, the, the sensor and the image quality are fantastic. And in a minute, I'll jump onto the computer. I won't go through too many pictures, but I'll just show you a couple which I think highlight some of the features of the camera, some of the good features. There's an obvious discussion that has to be had about whether or not this, whether or not you'd be better off with an iPhone or a smartphone, because in many ways, some of the some of the, the as as the as the iPhones are coming along, they're becoming the specs are much higher than this, you know. And it would seem that a, a smartphone might be the way, and it might be for some people. But for me, it's not the case. I like my cameras to be cameras, and I like my phone to be the phone. And you know, my my iPhone does a lot of different things, and I do use it for photography. But I don't want to be leaving it on a tripod, filming a time lapse while I'm doing something else. And I I sort of, you know, I can put a big memory card in here and I can be sure that I can spend the whole day um, you know, filling this up with raw pictures and video footage and I'm not gonna worry about storage. I've got different battery solutions so I don't have to worry about the battery going flat. So for me, it, this is better for my behind the scenes and as a backup camera than, than an iPhone, but for others that won't be the case. So is it still relevant in, in this day and age? I think it is, I think it really is. I think 20 megapixels is more than enough for a lot of people and I think that the zoom range is great and I think the image quality is great. And I even think that the video quality is great. It's got a stabilizer built in, which enables you to, you know, to, to it will stabilize out the footage and it will also stabilize the, the still images for you and it works really well. It's pretty basic by today's standards, but it does everything that you need. And you can tell great stories with this. If this was all you had, this was all you had. You could make some great videos and you could take some great still pictures with it. And you know, what more can you ask really? So I'm just gonna dive straight into the computer and show you a few of these pictures. In terms of price, I think I've seen them around for about 300 pounds, maybe a bit less if they're a bit battered and maybe a bit more if they're in mint condition. 
uh, I think is a reasonable buy. I know that the Mark III did have 4K, but I know that the Mark III also suffered with autofocus problems. I'm not going to compare them because they're different cameras, different price point. Uh, and this is just my experience of using it. and It's been very reliable, very reliable and has turned in some great pictures for me. And it's very discreet. You know, one of the things that I have noticed with it is that, you know, people react differently when you have this to when you're, you have a big DSLR camera. And so it does have its uh, the certain element of discreetness for street photography and things like that. Anyway, onto the computer, here we go. Okay, so here we are in Lightroom, and the first picture that I want to show you is this one. Uh, it's a raw file, very underexposed. Um, the lighting isn't perfect. There is lots of things wrong with this picture, but I just wanted to use it as an example to show you the potential dynamic range that this camera has of how much you can recover from the shadows, the how you can um, retain the highlights and the detail in the file. And so I've applied some pretty aggressive uh, post-production and we've come up with this. Uh, might not be to everyone's taste, but I'm quite happy with it. It was a very quick random picture taken quite candidly. Um, and the thing that I really want to show you is if I zoom in on the sleeping child's face, just look at that lovely grain structure. I just think that's beautiful. It just reminds me of HP5. And that's that's from this tiny little pocket camera. I'm really impressed with that. Um, the next file that I'm going to show you is this picture taken in London, which is uh, of the city taken from the DLR station with the traffic streaks um, and the train here. And this was shot at a 30 second exposure, actually using the camera's inbuilt neutral density filter, which is pretty amazing, which allows this kind of thing to happen without sticking filters on the front of the camera. It's quite handy. And, you know, the image quality is fine. It's not maybe quite as good as if it had been shot on, let's say, a full-frame DSLR, but it's reasonably good. And it, I think this was, if I remember rightly, this was actually shot through a window or through some railings or something. I think there were some things in the way. And, you know, this goes some way to sort of talk about the discrete nature of the camera that I think if you'd had a Canon 5D Mark IV, I don't think you'd been able to have put it on a tripod. I don't think there'd have been a space to put it on a tripod or you'd been a, maybe not even been allowed to put it on a tripod. Um, but the G7X, you just kind of, you know, pull it out and, and, and kind of wedge it into a window frame and just it just does the does the business. And, you know, I'm really happy with this frame. The next picture, or oh, the last picture, in fact, that I'm going to show you is, you know, from the city back down to the countryside where I live. And, you know, this is, you wouldn't net automatically think of a of a compact camera like the G7X as being a, a kind of a, a landscape camera. But actually, it's done a really good job, again, partly due to that, um, partly due to the neutral density filter, which has allowed this kind of buttery smooth water effect, but also you know, the dynamic range and the image quality of the camera is fine. And that 24 millimeter lens has uh, enabled me to sort of, you know, capture some foreground information as well as the wider landscape. So, you know, I'm as happy with this picture as if having taken it on the G7X, I, I couldn't be happier with it if I'd shot it on, you know, a camera that was kind of, you know, a pro level camera or whatever you want to call it. I think it's just as good a picture. And I've actually printed this out and it looks looks fine at size as well. So thank you very much for um, watching this video. Give me a thumbs up or leave me a comment if you've got a favorite um, kind of pocket camera that you like using or, you know, can recommend that something that I might be able to look at. But for now, I'm quite happy with my G7X. So long as I can get rid of the last few bits of dust, you know, I might actually try and take the take the lens apart and see if I can get it out. We'll see. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.